Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So, yeah, maybe a couple of words to my person as well for myself. So I'm biologist by training, neurobiologist, and I joined Zeiss in uh, 2012, and I am responsible for the multi-SEM, which is a multi-beam SEM. So it's a scanning electron microscope operating with multiple beams. And actually, it's all about speeding up um, the image acquisition. Um, so we're actually a little bit on the other side of um, the, the rest of the speakers panel today. So most people here are dealing with, with uh, how to deal with data and um, how, to, how, how to let loose AI algorithms on, uh, on these databases. We are more on the other side, so we are the ones building the machines to produce that data. Um, but just for a start, I would like to introduce you also to, to Zeiss as a, as a company. Um, and within Zeiss, everything is somehow related to optics or well, measurement in a, in a broader sense. And um, for those of you who don't know, Zeiss is fully owned, owned by a foundation. So in the end, there are no shareholders um, taking out dividends. And this, in the end, leads to a quite huge reinvestment of the revenue into, into R&D, um, which then turns out into um, quite a number of, of patent uh, applications um, and well in total it's 13 percent of the of the revenue that is um, usually reinvested into r d um, under this well rooftop of the foundation uh, there are several companies within Zeiss um, and as I said most of it has to do with optics in a, in a in a broader sense, so when it comes to the consumer market, so I will start from the from the right side. Um, the consumer markets. This is maybe things people may know. It's glasses, um, for example, or goggles for skiing. Um, um, the the um, Ferngläser, perspectives. Yeah, exactly. Um, so these these kind of um, devices. And then when we, when we go over to the to the left, uh, medical technology has a lot of to do with with optics, is um, operation microscopes, for example. Um, it's also the tools that are used for, ophthalm, um, ophth for by ophthalmologists, and also by the opticians. So the measurement machines um, that when you have your eyes measured, um, quite often are are coming from from Zeiss. And then um, the industrial quality and research segment um, is split into microscopy and uh, industrial measurements. Where, well, microscopy, we have heard a couple of times today already. In most of the cases, um, when electron microscopy was mentioned, most probably it was cryo TEM, so um, single particle reconstruction. Um, I'm going to talk about. A standard scanning electron microscopy, but not that standard because, as I said, it's a kind of special beast as it's operating with multiple beams. Um, and the, the industrial quality solution part of Zeiss is um, not so much using optics to measure. This is tactile measurements of, for example, components used in automotive, um, where these components are just measured in, in 3D. And actually, there also a lot of data is generated usually. And um, yeah, so. The, the one on the left side um, is something that is maybe a little bit more hidden to the, to the general public, the semiconductor manufacturing technology. However, this is the one um, generating basically most of the revenue. And it's um, also the part of the ice where the multi-SEM GmbH, which is the company I'm working for, is, um, is uh, associated with uh, today. And this is because this extremely fast electron microscope is meant also for wafer inspection. So to inspect the silicon wafers that are produced to, um, to microchips in the end. And as the structures on these chips are getting smaller and smaller, um, light optical methods won't do the job anymore. And that's actually the, the idea, the, the whole idea how this um, multi-beam electron microscope uh, was invented in the first place. So let me get into a little bit more detail here. Um, yeah, I said it already a couple of times. It's a, the fastest scanning and electron microscope in the world. And I will talk a little bit about a biomedical application, namely connectomics, which is a neurobiological application. And um, it aims for reconstructing of um, significant portions of the brain in 3D uh, to learn about the, the connections of neurons with each other. But maybe first a couple of um, 
well, key facts uh, regarding the multi-SEM. So it's a, in principle, it's an electron microscope. The only special thing is that it doesn't work with a single electron beam, but with 61 or even 91 beams. So there are two variants of that system. And with that, it's well, really, really fast when it comes uh, in generating image data. So the 91 beam machine is generating a little bit more than a terapixel per hour. So it's about 25 terabytes a day of image data that is generated with the system. And actually, our customers are pretty good in you know, even tuning that a little bit further. Um, one of our customers is generating about 70 terabyte per day of image data, which in the end needs to be processed. The resolution, the spatial resolution um, of the system is about 3.5 nanometers. This means that um, you're able to resolve uh, very fine processes in the, in the brain, on the, in these brain samples. Um, also, the, the ultrastructure, so the, the inner, well, the inner realm of the cell, like mitochondria, um, and also the, the synapses with the synaptic vesicles, for example, which is a, a quite important component when it comes to connectivity of the brain. Uh, of course, such a high throughput machine is only useful if it's more or less running automated. So a lot of development effort went into the automation of the system. So basically, it's designed for 24-7 operation, meaning that you set up an experiment which can run for days or even weeks, in principle, without human interaction anymore. Because otherwise, if you sit there and you, I don't know, microscopy usually has to do with manual labor. You sit on the system and you try to get the best image. Um, and here, this is something completely different because you basically try to set up the experiment in a way that, um, that you don't need to interact anymore. The fields of research um, which can make use of such a system um, are set up on the right side. So, I'm going to talk about neurobiology today, but also within pathology, um, there are, of course, applications that can make use of it. There, it's not that much reconstructing 3D volumes uh, or individual data sets. It's maybe more comparing mouse models with each other. So, I don't know, you have a patient um, sample, a biopsy, and um, you need to do a screening um, for, I don't know, certain uh, certain pathological uh, changes within the tissue. Um, besides biomedical research, uh, semiconductor research is, of course, an important topic. It's not only the manufacturing part that needs quality control. It's also on the research side um, where these devices um, need to be inspected in, in a certain way. The term reverse engineering is, of course, quite, well, negatively associated. In that sense, we mean it here. It's not that you copy something, like um, trying to, to plagiarize some, uh, some um, technologies from, from a competitor. It's actually the opposite. Um, people who are doing reverse engineering in the sense we are uh, using it are, for example, qualifying their suppliers. So they are getting microchips from a supplier, and they really want to make sure that it's, it's actually what they ordered. So what is done with these chips is they're polished down, and each layer is imaged sequentially, and then in the end, it's reconstructed. It's, in that sense, it's pretty similar to that neurobiological application I, I will talk about in a minute. Um, and then all kinds of materials, in principle, can be imaged with a scanning electron microscope. That's maybe a difference to, um, to a, a, a transmission electron microscope where the samples need to be transparent and basically thin. With a scanning electron microscope, you can image all kinds of surfaces. So they don't need to be um, electron transparent. And therefore, like battery components can be, for example, surveyed or solar cells or all types of electronics. But now let's, it's, I mean, it's the life science field day, so get, let's get back to life sciences. Um, and let's have a look at this uh, neuroscientific field of research called connectomics. Um, and it's about imaging brain circuitry. That's the whole story behind it. And you can look at this problem on different scales. 
and it's actually done on different scales. And the term connectomics also is used in these different um, modalities. So it's, sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to figure out what people actually mean when they talk about connectomics. You can either look at that um, on the kind of macro scale, um, which means the, the technologies here are functional or anatomical magnetic re resonance imaging or diffusion tangent imaging. Um, so the more health related and maybe clinical um, imaging technologies. The nice thing here, of course, it's, is of course, it's uh, the, the samples can live. So um, you don't need to take a biopsy. We can work with the living patients. But the spatial resolution is on the millimeter scale. This can tell you something about the large scale connections uh, within the brain, um, but not on the individual neuron basis. The, the mesoscale, which can be um, addressed with wide field light microscopy or x-ray imaging or also optical imaging, these are technologies um, that are not in vivo anymore, but more in vitro. Um, and they will give you hundreds of nanometers of, of micrometers resolution, so you can maybe address larger cells or at least um, like um, clusters of cells. But if you really want to know about the individual connections of an individual neuron with an individual other set of neurons, you really need to go down to the nanometer resolution. And also there, there are other, other technologies than just electron microscopy, um, confocal light microscopy, super resolution light microscopy. They can look at that detail at the tissue. However, in these light optical methods, you only see what you label for. So basically, you, I, I think uh, Ms. Peng is uh, talking about that later. Um, you're using fluorophores to label individual neurons, for example, and then you see them, but not the rest. The standard electron microscopy um, staining protocols give you basically the full picture because you label all membranes in the tissue. And if we now think of, again, why would one need a fast electron microscope? What's the idea behind that? Well, connectomics actually spans all these orders of magnitudes. I mean, there's, on the very small scale, there's uh, the individual synapse, there's the individual connection from one neuron to the other. On the other hand, an individual neuron can be centimeters or even a meter long, depending on the, on the species and depending on the individual system. But, so if you want to have the full picture of, of a circuit, but still resolving the fine processes, um, yeah, this is... This is kind of a difficult task because you need higher spatial resolution, but a large volume or a large area to be imaged. It takes a lot of time and will generate a lot of data. Well, at least the, the part where it takes a lot of time can be, um, can be a little bit alleviated. Now, it's still a lot of data. I can't help with that, unfortunately. So, and um, within size, the, the microscope portfolio basically offers all systems to, to address all these different scales, the rather easy light optical methods, um, X-ray microscopes, and then to the, to the very, very high resolved helium ion microscopes. And the multi-SAM is somewhere in the middle, so it, its spatial resolution is good enough to resolve these fine processes. But on the other hand, it's um, generating areas or it's looking uh, in, in, on a field of view that's comparable to a light microscope. And now the question, how does it do it? So this video is also under this QR code, and you can also find it um, with, this, with this link, just in case. Oh, did you want to take a picture? No, OK. <laughs> so um, now, how does it work? Um, the multi-SAM generates a single electron beam, just as any scanning other um, electron microscope as well. And I think the, oh, it does work. So here, the standard field emitter. And then we send this electron beam through a kind of shower head to um, generate multiple beams. And this pattern of this array of multiple beams is then scanned over the sample surface. And the signal electrons, the secondary electrons that are generated on the surface are directed back through the objective lens, um, split with a beam splitter into a second path um, into the detection path, and the signal electrons are hitting a scintillator up here. And the scintillator is basically 
make a light signal out of an electron signal. And while the beam's scanning over here, um, the signal intensity up here changes, and this generates the image pixel by pixel in the end. And if you compare that with a, what a single beam system would do, I think it makes pretty clear what the idea is. It just images a larger field of view at the same time. And that's the full trick. Now, if the area, the sample area, is even larger than just one of these hexagonally shaped fields of view, the stage has just moved in between. Again, step and scan, that's the same as with any other microscope as well. And then the, well, the sample areas are, I wouldn't say they're unlimited in size. Of course, there is a limit somewhere, but they can be fairly large. So if you now think of um, what does it actually mean from the, from the application perspective? What do people want to do? And why does it make sense to have such a fast electron microscope? Now, if you just have a cubic millimeter of tissue in mind, that's, it doesn't sound much, but for electron microscopic dimensions, this is huge. And remember, um, the spatial resolution required is about four nanometer in, in X and Y. Now, the standard section thickness people are using uh, in this type of research is about 30 to 50 nanometer. And if we now cut this, this cubic millimeter of tissue into 50 nanometer sections, we end up with 20,000 square millimeters that need to be imaged. And a standard scanning electron microscope takes about two and a half hours for one of these sections. So this will end up with well, almost six years of pure imaging time. There's no maintenance, no sample exchange, no vacation, no nothing is included there. This is really just the calculated pure imaging time. And this is just more than most research groups would even try to do. With um, the multi-beam electron microscope, this, the, the, this imaging time can be re reduced to three to four months just by parallelization. And this is now something that uh, people are actually doing nicely. Okay. And as I said, this is only a really, really, really small cutout. Um, to do this on a, on a larger scale, on larger data sets, is um, actually something that's pretty time consuming in processing. So let's have a look here. Okay. So this is an example of an even larger data set. So this is a cubic millimeter of tissue. It's not a, a cube, cubical cube, um, it's more a slab. Um, by two by three millimeters, um, and therefore not as thick, so not a millimeter thick. Um, it's human cortex data, and our first customer at Harvard University um, have uh, reconstructed this fully um, just last summer. So the, we have the system installed in 2014 already, but only now the first publications come out. So it's not the imaging that's the, the time consuming part now, but it's, it's more the, the reconstruction and the segmentation. But of course, this is also getting quicker and quicker. And this is the, um, the, the, the publication from that lab. Um, so it's about a peta uh, petabyte of data, 1.4 petabyte um, of, of image data, about a square millimeter, as I said. Um, and the processing is actually that uh, challenging that they didn't do it in-house. So they have a DDN system at their lab. Um, they use it for, for intermediate storage before they push it further to the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center where the pre-processing is done. And the actual segmentation in the end was done by Google. So at Google, there's a team of neuroscientists um, who is helping research groups with these tasks. Um, and so the actual data set is uh, hosted somewhere on some Google servers. Uh, under this QR code, the, um, the data set can be assessed. Um, oh, sorry, I thought something else. Um, the data set can be assessed via a tool called NeuroGlancer, which basically hosts these types of, um, of data sets for neuroscientists. Um, so now the question may, might be, why have this individual large data set? What would you learn from it? And actually, it's not all that you could do. Another one of our customers uh, in Frankfurt, um, he follows more the road of doing sm many smaller data sets. 
what he did was to compare data sets from mouse, macaque, and human, and um, to see if there are interspecies differences in the well, in the connections in the brain. And actually, they found something pretty interesting, which may be interesting for AI researchers as well, because what they found is um, the inhibitory, inhibitory interneuron networks in the brain. So the basically the the networks that silence um, other networks they change dramatically between mouse and monkey and human then, of course. So there seems to be some evolutionary changes in how the brain works between a mouse and a primate. And it seems to be the, the amount of inhibition and not the, the amount of excitation that one could maybe think of. No, it's actually the amount of inhibition. So that's a really interesting paper to look at because what they um, envision is that this may have uh, implications on how neural networks are designed, basically. Now, maybe again, just quickly summing up, and that relates to your question. Um, we were talking about a cubic millimeter now. A full mouse brain is not a petabyte of data, but about an exabyte of data. So, because it's, it's about, well, 500 cubic millimeters, maybe. And if we then would envision a full human brain, this would be four and a half zettabyte of data because it's 1.5 liters. It's even more volume. However, while well, people are actually thinking about the whole mouse brain, there are um, activities in the US for a large scale consortium is actually trying to get this done. Um, and the individual components for the workflow are in principle available. So the first steps, like, like the sample preparation, the, the imaging part, um, the hardware for storage and computation are there. Um, the only thing that is still, I would say, um, heavily researched is um, the large-scale image processing. So the, the, um, the high-performance uh, computation algorithms that are required to do this, uh, this um, image processing parts. But they're there. Um, there are people working on it. There are researchers publishing and putting their code on GitHub. And, well, hopefully this somehow gives some momentum and people start uh, um, scaling this up even further. And these are the people um, who are actually doing it. So um, most of our customers are neuroscientists. These are the ones on the left. There are a couple of other um, research directions that are also served. You see, it's, it's not many tools, right? So the multi sem is nothing that, we, I don't know, sell in the tens or hundreds of systems. Um, so it's really a, a kind of a niche product, and it's also pretty expensive. So therefore, there are not too many of them around, not yet. Um, but it's getting more and more, and actually we're, <laughs> we're getting orders now, well, in much higher frequency than uh, the couple of years back. Um, and as you see, it's, it's pretty much evenly distributed over the world. So we have three systems in the US. We have three now, well, soon four systems in Germany. Um, we have three systems in China and, uh, um, and uh, Japan. So it's quite evenly distributed globally. Uh, exactly. Not yet. Not yet. We're working on it. <laughs> No, it's actually looking pretty good. <laughs> there will be more. <laughs> so, and again, if you go to the whole mouse brain, um, as I said, this is uh, at the moment led by Jeff Lichtman and um, a couple of other researchers in the US. Um, this is actually what people are now trying to do within the next couple of years. Now, maybe just for a comparison, um, the first connectome of an organism that was um, that was published back in the 90s, 80s, 90s. Well, this is the nervous system of C. elegans, which has exactly 312 neurons. So, and that was done over the course of about 10 years. So people were printing out um, TEM images and drawing them by hand and putting them together with duct tape and like following the volume like this. Um, the full mouse brain could also be a project that may take 10 years. Well possible. But on the other hand, it's a couple of more neurons. And I think, therefore, it's, well, it's maybe um, 
okay that it will take a couple of years. And um, yeah, with that, I think I'm at the end of my talk. Maybe one thing to just keep in mind, that's maybe the key message. If you're dealing with electron microscopy, um, this is maybe the, um, the key figure that you, that you can keep in mind. It takes about five minutes for a square millimeter at four nanometer resolution. But as you're maybe more interested in data, um, it's about 100 of gigabytes of data and about 10,000 individual image tiles that are generated in this five minutes. So that's, well, maybe the drawback of that fascinating new technology. Um, you still need to deal with the data in the end. Um, these other QR codes lead you to um, a volume electron microscopy campaign by Zeiss with, with a nice poster and a, a booklet with short articles. There's also one uh, from my team. Um, and the web page where you can find more information about the multi-SEM or otherwise just ask me while I'm here. And I think with that I'm done. Thank you. And hand over to you. Well, before you go, thank you, thank you very much for, uh, for that. And um, I think we're solved with the technology problems now. <laughs> I've had to reload it and it's all set. Um, one of the things that um, actually we spoke about yesterday uh, when we met was the question of actually knowing the question to ask in some yeah. ways. Now, if you look at the sheer amount of data that's kind of coming through in this, um, just the, if you had a mouse connect home, um, who, who, how do you actually find the questions to ask? Are there new tools do you think we're going to need in the next couple of years? What could be done to help our find the questions, to ask the right questions, to find something new? Well, I think... I think that's maybe the, 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 the same thing with all basic research. First of all, you, you need to have that data. And then, I mean, I think it was the same with the human genome. You, you, in the beginning, people thought this will answer a lot of questions, but at the end, it opened up even more. More questions, and, yeah. Exactly, and I think it's maybe the same here. I, I can think of a lot of questions that could be answered, maybe not with this individual one whole brain, but more with the approach of comparing smaller volumes to each other. So, for example, comparing different um, regions of the brain, different systems, so motor system versus visual system, for example, um, like sensory and motor, uh, then comparing individuals one to each other, how, how large are the individual differences. Um, then, of course, you can do screening for pathologies, you can have mouse models for different different diseases, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, um, and then compare that to, to the gold standard of a, of a healthy mouse, for example. And then, of course, you can go to human brains um, and, and see how the changes are there. So as a neuroscientist, I actually can think of thousands of questions <laughs> that could be answered. Um, and I, I, I think it's the same for most of our customers, maybe. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, question over there from Manusas. So a quick question on the, on the mouse brain. So if you map, let's say, the entire mouse brain, it's a thousand petabytes of image data. So uh, that's, that's a lot of, um, and as, as much as you would like to have a single user using a, a one exabyte system, it, it sounds very much. So my question is, because you have a repeating pattern, in a sense, in the mouse brain and, or, and everywhere, would it make, make sense to, to compress the data or would it spoil the quality and the outcome? Is there any study about that? I'm not sure if there is yet something out about that. And I'm, I actually would question the repetition thing because most probably yes. I mean, that's, that's one of the ideas within uh, neurobiology that you have kind of circuit motives that repeat itself. However, this is not proven yet. So this would be one question to ask, for example. And may these motifs be different in a sensory system compared to a motor system, for example? And from what we know from just basic histology, it seems to be the case that things are different. So this would be the, maybe one, one thing one could prove with that. Um, and the, the question when it comes to compression, uh, compression of the data, well, I think the image data, electron micro, microscopic image data is really hard to compress because um, in principle, you need a lot of the information, and so you can only get rid of very limited amount of pixels. However, once it's segmented, 
And once you only have the network information, it's basically only nodes and vectors that are connected somehow. Um, I think then it can be compressed quite well. But first, you need to get there. But first, the data, then we, then we decide, I guess. So you, you need the segmentation to happen to be able to shrink the data size. Can this segmentation happen in real time or close to real time? Well, not yet. <laughs> At least not what yet. What does it take? Um, so uh, as I, as I um, uh, pointed out, our customer in Bonn, um, he's generating about 70 terabytes a day. And so he showed that it takes, for him, it takes about a month or maybe two months to acquire a cubic millimeter of tissue. And then it will take, what is that, I think, six months to process the data, to, to have it in a reconstructed way. And then it takes another, like, five or six months to proofread it. Because just to make sure that there are no errors in the segmentation. So there are algorithms that pick the, well, the most dubious areas, maybe because the image quality wasn't that well. And by now, it's still th that humans need to check that. Humans need to proofread that. But there's extremely much going on at the moment. So there are a lot of really, really uh, good research groups working on these problems and utilizing AI algorithms also to, to improve the proofreading so that less uh, human interaction is required there. But at the moment, this is really the most time-consuming part still. I'm, I, I really cannot tell you how quick the development will go there, hopefully. Okay, thank you very quick. much. Sorry, I have just one another question. So regarding the, um, the electronic uh, microscope it, uh, itself, for you, the next step is improving the accuracy, so going uh, on a smaller scale than the four nanometers, or it's more about increasing the number of beams? Very good question. So for this application, it doesn't make too much sense to improve the resolution, and this is just due to the sample preparation. So what you do with the staining is um, you introduce osmium, heavy metal, uh, to bind to the membrane, and these molecules are actually pretty large. So um, a, a friend of mine once said, it's a little bit like using a, a thick brush to paint fine structures. <laughs> and in, in some sense, this is correct. So, um, but on the other hand, the multi-SEM is also used for other applications. And there, a better spatial resolution would be really helpful. Uh, so speaking of semiconductor um, research applications, where the structures get like to the five nanometer size or something, and then better spatial resolution would really be helpful. Um, and again, the other way around, for the biological application, more beams is also maybe not the, well, the first development goal because it's already quite fast, and people would first need to be able to deal with the data. Um, on the other hand, other applications <laughs> may make use of an even faster system. So um, what we've shown is that, in principle, the system could go to 331 beams, which would be like adding another five shells of beams. Um, but this was just on a prototype level. So this is not something that is really pursued at the moment. But in principle, it would be possible. <laughs> 